Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dag Aren. I'm sitting at Lund University working as a co-head of unit. And um, I will be talking about RNA-seq data analysis. And uh, we're gonna focus mostly on bulk uh, RNA uh, and differential expression. That's what you're gonna do for the exercise. But we'll take up a few things along the way. So this is the content that we will cover. Um, and we'll go through the different parts of anything from um, the basics of, of the RNA and the central dogma all the way down to how to analyze uh, this type of data. And, and please do interrupt me if you have any questions along the, right, uh, along the line. Um, or if you want to know some more details about a few, few things, and we'll try to solve it. So just a basic background then, um, just a reminder of for everyone what we're dealing with here. So now we're not looking at the complete uh, genome, but we're interested in what is expressed. <clears throat> and this, is, uh, this image is actually eukaryotic centric, as you might recognize. So are there anybody that's working with bacteria or archaea in the group? Yeah, some of you. So I'll try to mention a few things that could be different there that you need to think about. Otherwise, we can talk after the, the lecture as well uh, about certain peculiarities between the eukaryotes and, and the prokaryotes. So as you see, it's quite a complex architecture for, for the eukaryotic genes. Um, and, and I think the most important part to remember if you're working with a eukaryote is that you have exons and introns. So that needs to be taken into account when you're analyzing your RNA-seq data. Um, it's a small part of the genome usually. Again, this is an, uh, for the eukaryotes, for, the, for bacteria, you can have a very gene-dense uh, genome where actually a lot of the coding regions uh, it's covering most of the genome, actually. So, <clears throat> sorry. So it's, it's um, very dynamic. That's why we're studying RNA, right? We want to see which genes in the genomes are actively transcribed at any given time point or at any given um, tissue that you're studying. And you can use RNA-seq for a number of different purposes. So here's some examples that we oftentimes see, but this is not an exhaustive list. So there could be things listed uh, that are not listed here that you might want to do with, with uh, your RNA data. So you, typically you want to, for example, identify gene sequences in a genome. So basically trying to annotate where in the genome do I have my genes. RNA-seq data is really a, a really nice way of getting that information. So you would have the transcribed genes, you can then identify it through the RNA-seq samples. Uh, you can learn a lot about the, the gene function, uh, differential gene expression, when is this gene expressed and where, under which conditions. And this is something that we're gonna uh, work more on in the, in the lab. Uh, you can also look at isoforms or allelic expressions, and there are certain sequencing technologies that are specifically good for these purposes. We'll come back to that later. And then I think somebody was also already mentioning that they are interested in not only the gene expression itself, but, but also how that is related to other genes and the regulation and, and co-expression of, for example, pathways or more complex networks in the cell. And then you can work with gene fusion. This is uh, of great Im importance in some systems where you have genes that are actually fused. Uh, and the, you can learn a lot about the evolutionary patterns from that and function. Uh, and then you have RNA e editing. But as I said, this is not an exhaustive list. So maybe, is there anybody that wants to do something else with your RNA-seq data that's not listed here? Maybe we can add it for another course. No, so I think we've covered at least the, the most common uses of RNA-seq here. So a quick overview of the workflow then, how would you go about working with this? As with any 
experiment, you would have your experimental design or your study design. And that is really the foundation of everything that we do from there on. So it's super important that you, you do plan that and we'll, I'll talk more about it and really try to get as good an experimental design as you can possibly do. Once you have that, you can go about doing your uh, sampling, get your RNA extracted. You make a library from, from those RNAs. And as you probably know, RNA is really sensitive. So we, we translate it in, usually into to, um, cDNA so that it's more stable and then make libraries from that. These libraries are then subsequently sequenced. And then you have the possibility of analyzing your sequence data. So that's where basically where the bioinformatics comes in where we have these gray parts here, starting with a quality control um, and then do mapping. If you have a genome already, you would go ahead and map to that genome or a transcriptome. You can do that as well. If you don't, then you have to take this detour of first making a Divinovo uh, assembly of the sequences you have so that you get the list of transcripts that you can then use for, for mapping against. So, th so that depends a little bit whether you have some genomic resources available to you or whether you have to make those on your, on your own or if you have a non-model organism. So once you've done the mapping, you can then move on to quantification of these, basically counting how many times did I get a sequence for a certain feature or a gene or an exon, depending on what you're interested in. Um, and then, that is most of the heavy lifting has been done at that point. And once you have these lists of counts, you can actually move the, those data sets into your local desktop or laptop and, and do analysis on, on those subsequently. So it's, it's mostly this top part that, that requires that you use, for example, the UPMAX cluster. And then, then you can start using your own computers, for example, in R, if you're familiar with that, or other systems, and, and do the, the correlation, clustering, um, looking at the, the samples, how they are grouping in a PCA or, or MDS plot, and then doing the differential gene expression. Any questions so far? Yeah, so we'll go through uh, most of these different steps in, in a little bit more detail. But just so you have the overview of what, what steps are important here for the workflow of this rna -seq analysis. So going back then to the experimental design, I think one of the most common questions that we do get is how many biological replicas do I actually need? Is it enough using three? Um, usually we say, well, it's, I, I would say it's the absolute, absolute minimum, but it's recommended. It's nice to have between six to 12. You might think that that sounds like a, like a lot. And, and sometimes it may not be possible to get that many replicates, but if possible, it really pays off. You get much more power in your analysis and you will be much more sure about your results. You can afford some samples to fail um, so, so you're much better off, even though it's, a it's more costly, of course, and there's more work involved in generating these replicates. Um, but usually it, it pays off to spend more on getting enough biological replicates than looking at, for example, a lot of different conditions. So that's something that I really want to emphasize. It, it's really worthwhile to have good and, and many replicates. Do you think uh, you would? Yes. So, so the question was whether you have, if, if you do the experiment multiple times, if I understood you correctly, and then you pool it, and after that, you go back to these different steps. You have your experimental design, you do your RNA extraction from these different ones, yeah. you pool them, you pull them, and then you make the library. Yes. 
then you lose the possibility of using them as independent biological replicates because you've mixed them in the pooling. You can do pooling after the library preparation. I'll come to that because then you have made a tag for e each of the libraries. So you can actually then afterwards bioinformatically separate them out and use them as separate, uh, as separate biological replicates. But if you pool them too early and then do the library, then you have no chance of knowing whether a sequence comes from you know, the, the, the um, extraction A or B. And so you can't really use them as, as biological replicates. Yes? Yeah, uh, or at least, as it's indicated here, try to, to make sure that it's not confounding with the, the samples that you're running. So here's an example where you have, in this first image here, you have a confounding where you basically, you've done your experiment, <clears throat> and you have condition A and B, and you extract all your, your RNA, for example, from, from uh, condition A, at one in one day and one time at one time and and the others that you want to compare with another day for practical reasons you might not be able to do all of it at once and then you do the rna extraction you do the library prep and then you sequence them perhaps l1 and l2 represent different lanes so they are separated in, and you have different lanes when you have sequenced them and then you start comparing then the a's and b's if you see a difference, then what happens is that you don't really know if the difference you see has to do with the fact that you extracted these or, or treated these different days, or whether it's actually because they are sample A and sample B. Whereas when you have this balance that is the right hand side here, where you mix the A and B, when you do the extractions, you put them um, both A and B samples on the same lane, but you still may use multiple lanes, then you're actually able to see whether the difference it has to do with whether this sample is classified as A or B, or whether it's something technical that all the samples that was run on L1 looks different from the L2 and L3. Then you know it's, it's just a technical thing that happened in the sequencer and not what you're looking for. So, so th this is one way of trying to think about how you set up your experimental de design so you can separate the actual biological signal from technical mishaps. There will be some differences and, and some of them can be really difficult to avoid, but as much as possible, try to, to set up a design so that you can identify such batch effects as it's called. Um, <clears throat> so then this also says, uh, we'll talk more about the RIN values later, but it's basically the quality measure of the RNA. So how intact or degraded are the RNA uh, samples? So this is from the total RNA before you start making any libraries or anything else. So it's like a quality check. And, and that has a lot of influence on what results you're gonna get in the end. So try to get as high quality RNA as possible. And if you have some differences, make note of that because that can influence your results downstream. Okay, so once you have your RNA extracted, you've checked your, your RIN values are good, then you can pr proceed to do the library and ultimately the sequencing. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, you have the mRNA transcript. You do a, a cDNA, so complementary DNA out of it. There's a fragmentation step, either chemically or by sonication, so physical breakage of these DNA fragments. And then you add adapters. Those are labeled in red here. And you can then take that library on to do sequencing. You can either decide to do single uh, read sequencing, single end sequencing, <clears throat> as, as depicted here to the left, basically just meaning that you sequence from one, one end of these small fragments. Or you can do paired end uh, read sequencing, which is the most commonly used these days. 
um, where you actually you sequence from, from both ends. Um, so typically paired end read sequencing is what you're doing. It's very minor difference in cost. It's the same work of making the libraries and RNA extractions, etc. And sometimes you get a little bit better mapping. But uh, for RNA sec, at least when you work with differential expression, it's not so. It doesn't add so much more because you still work with one fragment is one count in your count matrix. When you talk about how many times have I uh, found this gene to be transcribed. So whether you sequenced in both ends or just one end, it doesn't really matter. You, you will still treat that as, as one, um, one fragment or one count. But typically nowadays we do uh, paired end sequencing. We don't really need to. I, I, I've seldom seen single end uh, reads these days. <clears throat> so the workflow for differential gene expression, so that's the abbreviation for DG, you can use a number of different tools. Yes. Uh, sure. <clears throat> yep. Well, or... Yes, yeah, so I'll come back. Yeah. We can take it now. That's, that's a good question. So uh, Folie you can use, and that's the recommended if you're working with the eukaryotes. So again, the difference between the bacteria archaea and the um, eukaryotes. So if you're interested in messenger RNAs, so genes coding for proteins, then the recommendation is to use the foliate tail um, selection. Because all the mature mRNAs, maybe we have it even here, or yeah, well, we might come to it. <clears throat> yeah, so, you, so there's an addition of a poly A once the RNA has matured. So you can use that to get, <clears throat> to get the messenger RNA because it only consists of a few percent, I think more than 80% or 90% of the RNA that you extract are ribosomal genes. And you don't want to sequence those over and over and over. It's a lot of waste of, of uh, sequencing if you're only interested in these messenger RNAs. So, so you use this poly A selection or ribosomal um, RNA depletion to get rid of the ribosomal part of, of the total RNA so that you get mostly uh, messenger RNAs. Poly A is the recommended for, for eukaryotic sequences. So when you have a poly A tail, when you don't, like in bacteria, for example, you would then have to go for RNA depletion. RNA depletion, basically, it, it uh, aims at trying to hybridize these conserved regions of the, the ribosomal RNAs and remove those. But if you're working with a non-model organism, the matches may not be great, so you might still have a lot of the ribosomal uh, transcript still in there. So even though you've done some subtraction, it, it may not be as clean. So typically, if you can do poly A, uh, if not, then you can consider doing the ribosomal RNA depletion. Certain cases, some people argue that it's, it's a waste of time even doing that, and they will just sequence as much as they can so that they still get enough number of reads for the, for the messenger RNAs to avoid any biases or losing any transcripts when you do these subtractions. So, so there are different schools there, but then you have to be prepared for sequencing a very large amount of sequences. Yes. <clears throat> so if you're interested in long no-coding RNAs, then, then you cannot do typically poly A selection because I think most of them, if not all, do not, do not have that. So then you have to use other means. But typically I would recommend that you do talk to your sequence provider, whether that is from SciLife Lab, the NGI or others, uh, and talk to them about what you particularly want to do. And then they will recommend which approach would be the most appropriate in your case. Most of the time they will recommend poly A selection, but like you say, if you're working with microRNAs, small non-coding RNAs, or, or some other 
a type of RNA uh, or bacteria, etc., then they will have some other suggestions what you should try out. Yeah? Any other questions? No? Okay, great. Then we'll just move on a little bit. Um, so yeah, so the, in the workflow for, this is for differential gene expression. Um, to the left, you have the general steps that you have to do, more or less regardless of which type of tools you're gonna use. You will get your reads from the sequence provider for your different samples. Uh, you'll do some mapping either on a reference that you have generated, whether it's a genome or a transcriptome, uh, or, um, yeah, and so you'll do map to if you have genome available as well. Then you'll do the quantification, and finally, the differential gene expression to look at which genes are differentially expressed between these conditions, given the, the variation that you have in these biological replicates of each of these conditions. So for the reads, we do quality control, FOSQ. Um, you do the mapping that could be done with STAR, HiSat2. Um, they are quite similar in how they work. And then there's other uh, ways of working with it, which has uh, is using these uh, pseudo <clears throat> alignments like Callisto and Salmon. So they use a, a different approach that is faster and quite often surprisingly um, good uh, mapping. Um, you do quantification, you can use different tools there. Feature counts is one of them that you will use in the lab. And then you do differential expression, for example, using DSEC2, which is an R package and edge R as well, or Lima, you can use uh, ball gown, sleuth, a little, little bit different depending on which uh, workflow you decide to use. So there are a multitude of different options here. Um, and whether you're gonna choose one or another, that is a little bit up to you. Um, there could be some differences between different fields, or you could have colleagues that have experience with working with one or the other or simply that you, you learn how to use uh, one of these workflows in, in a course like this one, and then it makes sense to try that first and see if you're happy with the results. Some other differences could be depending on what you want to do downstream. Um, are you interested in looking at differences in exons or in genes themselves and stuff like that? That can influence your, your choices here. But overall, I think that try, try one that you feel most comfortable with and see what you get. And then you can reconsider if, if you need to do some other uh, additional workflow to see what you get. So <clears throat> quality control of the reads. It's, it's always good to get a feel for the quality of your data before you start doing a lot of analysis get a feel for what you have. Do you have some weaknesses in, in the, you know, how much sequencing you got? What's the quality of these sequences? Um, in general, when you work with Illumina, which is the most commonly used for, for differential expression because you get such high counts and that's really what counts in this game, then you typically get good quality scores. Uh, overall, because it efficiently filters away the bad quality sequences. But no matter whether you got, got a report from the sequence provider or not, look at the quality yourself. You know, convince yourself that it's worth spending hours and hours on analyzing before you move on. It's so easy to just have a quick look. It's probably okay, and then run for it. But if you spend a lot of time and then realizing that, oh yeah, maybe I should have you know, excluded this weird sample and so on, then it's nice to try and identify that early on. Don't be afraid of throwing out data. I think that is, I mean, we have the capacity of making a lot of data relatively cheap. Your time is valuable. 
So I'd rather suggest that you throw out things that you don't think is good enough than to try and salvage things by spending hours and hours and trying to, to fix you know, not so good looking samples. Okay, that's my rant. Um, yeah, so you see a long list of, of different things that you could check for here. <clears throat> QC fail is mentioned, but I think it's pretty old now. I wish that they would have been updated because it's a great idea. They tried, to, they tried for a long time to collect different issues that they have discovered uh, related to the sequence qualities and, and issues with, with sequencing and new protocols and, and so on. So there was a lot of information there, but now it's not updated anymore. I think the, it's, it's like five years ago since they updated it or something like that now. So it, it's not, I mean, both the libraries and sequencing is moving quite fast. So, so it's not as important anymore. Um, fast QC, I think you've seen this before, right? Or at least you've looked at that, right? So I won't go through all the details there. But it's really good to look at those um, individually, of course, um, for the samples. But it can be a lot of work, of course, if you have a large RNA-seq experiment where you have lots and lots of replicates, many different conditions. There will be a lot of FASTQ um, files to, to go through and evaluate. So you also have this multi-QC that I think you will also look into. So you'll have... <clears throat> Um, maybe I should say that here, when you look at the, the green dots for uh, whether this is passed or not, that is based on uh, genome, I mean, a theoretical genome that have 50% GC in the genome. So like with everything, when you do an experiment, you have to think to what extent does that apply to my experiment? So I would say if I got an RNA-seq data set and it was in the, in the FASTQC was screened throughout, I would be really worried <laughs> because that means that something has gone wrong. This is not, either it's not my sample or something has really gone wrong in the, in the sequencing because we expect the expression to be dynamic, to be changing. Some genes will be expressed a lot some will be uh, less highly expressed. So it wouldn't behave in the fast QC just like this theoretical genome with 50% GC. I would expect that there will be a lot of uh, sequences that would be identical. Uh, there will be a lot of things that, that would be considered as, as duplicates because it's a highly expressed gene that might be fairly short. So the chances of, of sequencing the same part multiple times is pretty high, actually. So if it's green throughout on an RNA-seq, I would definitely be worried. So every time you're analyzing some data, think about what do I have? I mean, a FASTQ file, that's just a format. Think about the biology. How did you get this sequence? What do you expect from it? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. Right. So the question was whether uh, when you have, so in this one, let's see where we have uh, overrepresented sequences. Yeah. So when you have overrepresented sequences, these could be short parts that you get the same six bases over and over and over in one position. For example, if you talk about fast QC, you have this overrepresented sequences. So it's not the entire read necessarily. Um, but we'll come to the problems of PCR duplicates. It's a, a real problem. Um, but there are some ways of trying to distinguish whether you have a problem with PCR duplicates, so like artificially inflating the counts of certain genes or, or transcripts versus actual real differences in the expression in the cell. 
Um, so there are some things like we'll come to that, but like UMIs that you can use that you actually tag uh, molecules before you do the PCRs. So if you get the same tag multiple times, you would know that this, this is um, a PCR duplicate and can be ignored in the counting. Yeah, but a very good question. Um, yeah, I won't go through all these different things. You, you will have a look at, you look at high quality uh, reads and, and then you see this waterfall effect when you have lower quality. So you see the quality just drops towards the end. Um, we don't see that as much anymore uh, for the Illumina, but if it occurs, then you need to make a decision whether you should keep these ones or not. Um, and that's something to, to uh, keep in mind when you do this quality control. Trimming, um, that's also a, a chapter on its own. There's a lot of different tools for it. Some I think I mentioned here, like Cut Adapt, etc., Print Seek, and so on. And there are others as well, Trimomatic and, and others. Um, again, two schools, some think that it would be really nice to make sure that you trim away all of these synthetic sequences like adapters and so on that are not part of the RNA before you do mapping. But um, there are other, other groups saying that actually since the mappers can soft clip or actually they ignore uh, regions that does not map, uh, so they will just ignore if you have some adapter sequence and still map the, the rest of the sequence to the, re to the correct point. So, so this is something that can be done to some degree, and I, but I will definitely always look at it. To what degree do I have a lot of adapters still in my sample? Ideally, it should be a low number. And if it's a high number, you need to think about whether it's worthwhile to do an additional cleaning step here with the trimming or not. We have mapping <clears throat> and here I think that the most important thing to, to remember is that you can use different mappers but make sure that they are splice aware at least if you're working with eukaryotes because when you do mapping you map the C CDS which you have here so, so the a transcript where the introns have been excised out. So when that uh, sequence is mapped to the genome where you do have the introns, that means that some sequences, for example, this one to this one, where you actually have the read split and you have a lot of space in between here. Uh, and, and you need the mapper to allow for that to happen uh, because otherwise you will miss a lot of the map mapping uh, here. That is expected that the reads will be split uh, between two exons with, with actually no sequence in between for the intron. And since introns can be very large in some organisms, this can be a problem sometimes for the mappers to deal with if they are not splice aware. Okay. So different aligners, there's a multitude of, of um, papers testing and, and claiming that their software is the best. Um, but I think this one is an interesting example where they have compared different aligners. So this is from Barusa et al. 2016. So if you click on these links, you will go to the actual uh, reference that we are, we are talking about here. Um, so Basically, what it says is that, yes, you can use different aligners. Some of them will be faster than others. So they are designed, the algorithms are designed to be more or less fast. But if you think about the, the quality on how well it, it aligns and how correct it does, the, the largest difference is whether you're using the right parameters for that so for some, it makes a huge difference. So for example, this is an older version like HiSat, and you have HiSat 2. The default, the green bar, which is the aligned correctly, is quite small. But if you tweak the settings a little bit and change the parameters, suddenly you're really high up and, and can correctly align the, the vast uh, majority of all the reads. So when you that's so, so there are two things here it's not necessarily so that 
you know, switching between different aligners is the solution. It could be that you should just change the parameters. Uh, and the other thing is don't just use default values all the time. It's very easy to just say, okay, I'll, I'll just trust uh, whoever wrote this software and, and go for the default. And that's fine to do um, when you start, but look at the amount of mapping, what percentage of your reads mapped and how does it look? Am I happy with this? And then see if you need to, to adjust it. Maybe it's adjust, maybe those settings are adjusted for some completely different organism, usually human. And then if it doesn't work so well for your organism or your system, you might need to change the parameters a little bit to, to get a better result. Again, this is important because it's the mapping that we're basing all the counts on. So it's really important to try and get that as correct as possible. A minimum, um, I don't know if there's a clear minimum. I guess it depends on what you need to do. But I really, um, I would have liked to see a high proportion mapping, even especially if, if you have a genome uh, for, for the organism you're working with, then having, you know, mapping that is above 80%, for example, would be good. If you, if you only see 40%, that's of course a warning sign. What are the other 60%? Why doesn't it match? Is it some kind of contamination? You could have other organisms here that, that is not mapping. And maybe you need to do some, some investigation about these unmapped reads. What are they? What happened? So again, trying to have critical thinking. If you're not getting a high uh, percentage mapping, is it because of the settings? Or is it because you have some sequences in there that actually is not existing in the genome that you're mapping to? In many cases, you might be working with sister species. So there's no genome for the organism that you're working with, but you want to make a transcriptome available for that. And then you're mapping to a related species. And then the percentage could be lower, but then you should be aware that there could be some biases here that you're, if you're matching to, you'll, you'll it would be more likely to match to conserved genes than those that are highly variable. So you can get a bias there in the results so that you're a little bit careful in interpreting the results, especially if the sequences are the percent coverage of or the percent of reads that are matching is low. Um, and then you can consider doing a de novo assembly of that the reads you have, and then those that percentage should go up because then you don't have the problem there of, of matching to something that is evolutionary distant. Okay. Um, yeah. For, so for then it's uh, mentioned here also the increased accuracy that the accuracy of the, the mapping and how correctly mapped it is, is dependent on what you want to do with those results afterwards. So I think that's a, an important point. Always think about what are you going to use this for at the later stage. If you, if you do differential expression and you get some reads wrongly mapped, it's not going to completely change your picture. But if you're working with specific variants or very specific things, then it might be very, very important to, to be certain about the mappings that you have. Um, yeah, so you've seen the, the reads, what they look like already, where you have this fast queue um, format. And then you would have the reference genome and then the annotation file. So the annotation file is basically just describing where you have certain so-called features. That could be, for example, genes or other um, important regions of the genome that you can, and it's just a tab delimited uh, file illustrating where do you have, what's, what's the, for example, the chromosome ID, um, 
information about that and the coordinates, the, the direction of, of this match and so on, and saying that some information also about the gene name or ID. So this GFF or GTF annotation file is coupled to a specific genome. So this can happen sometimes when you're downloading or, or having references that you accidentally get one version of, of the genome and another version of the GTF or GFF file. And then your, your coordinates in the GTF file doesn't match the genome and you can get some, some uh, strange things happening of the results because it's the coordinates here that determine if you have a read aligning within this gene, then you add a count to that gene saying that I've seen X amount of, of reads matching within this region. So that's the gene that you should be, okay, so that you're, you're counting how many times is this gene um, found in a particular sample. So of course, if, if those are mixed up, then the, those counts will be all wrong. So be really careful when you're working with your RNA-seq samples or anytime you're working with a genome and a, a GTF or a GFF file, that you're really certain that it's, it's the same, coming from the same version of the same genome. Okay, um, that said. We have the alignment. I think you've been working with SAM and BAM files already. And this is just an illustration that if you can compress, you will save a lot of space and make the people happy that are working with their servers and clusters. Um, because all of this work that we're doing on RNA-seq or whether it's any other sequence data, it takes a lot of space and, and we should be mindful about that and try to use as little as possible without um, influencing our work. So uh, you already heard Mark was, was saying that it's, you don't have to have all the intermediate files, for example. So exactly for the same reason. It's also a good idea to do visualization so that once you've been doing your mapping and you're working with it, Look, look at the results. Does it make sense? Take some sample, maybe you have a favorite gene or group of genes. Have a look and see, do I see any weird things happening here or does it look uh, like you're covering nicely the, the exons where you're supposed to have RNA-seq? Do you have a lot of mappings outside? Then you might have some, some DNA contamination here. So there are a lot of other things like that that, is, uh, that can influence your, your interpretation. And it's a good idea to have a look at some, you can't look at everything, but have a look at some of them just to make sure that, the, again, the data looks like you would expect for this type of experiment. You can do a lot of quality control actually on the alignments as well looking at how many uniquely mapped reads do you have, how many genes, uh, or sorry, how many reads were mapped or unmapped. Uh, if you had paired end sequencing, do they behave like you, you expect so that they are in the right direction, they are <clears throat> um, have the right size in between based on how this library was produced. Um, just to make sure that it, it looks like you have a good alignment and the mapping is, is uh, uh, high quality. So with multi-QC, you can summarize the result of many samples in one plot or several plots here. So, so here you would have many different samples and you can have a look and see how many are uni uniquely mapped, which is the dark uh, blue mapped to, to multiple loci is a light blue. And you can see there are some differences between the samples, but overall it, it looks pretty similar, at least in, in the number of uh, mapped or uniquely or multiple. And then you have some that are unmapped for, for various reasons. Either the sequence was too short or there are other reasons why it didn't map. 
And if that percentage is high, like we talked about before, then that could be worthwhile to, to have a closer look at the unmapped ones to see why is this. In this case, it's more than 90%. So this is something that to say, okay, this is fine. I, I did map what I expect. So I'm happy and, and can proceed at least based on this uh, plot. Yeah, so you can look at a number of different uh, features. Here it's using the GFF file to see uh, where, where you're supposed to get matches in the genome and see whether it's inside or outside. Is it matching introns uh, or not? Is it matching between genes or actually within the CDS as you would expect? Yeah, and here you can see how many different plots you can dig into. Uh, and it's easy to generate all of these, but of course it's harder to, to investigate each and every one of those. So I would say that there are some that you can have a closer look at. And then if, if those look fine, you might not look at all these different aspects. But it's good to know that they are there. So if you have something that looks funky, you can look at the data in many different aspects and see if you can make sense out of it and understand why is it looking the way it does. So one example that I think is quite useful is, or several, is the read mapping profile. So where are the reads typically matching in the transcript? So you, ex you expect something looking like this, that most of them will map in the middle and then you have this drop in, in the positions. Um, sorry, yeah. And then you have the, this is the genia body coverage. That's what I was talking about. This is the beginning of, or the percent of position of the gene body. So this is the five prime end where we have the zero here and you have the at the hundred that's a hundred percent that's the very end of of the gene and here they have mapped the different rin values remember that i talked in the beginning about the rin values which are the quality of the rna rna you can use um you can get a measure of how well or how in, uh, what do you call it? How, um, how intact are the RNA, especially the, the ribosomal RNA since they are in large abundance. So you would expect the different ribosomal RNAs to come up as big peaks. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't, or if you see a smear of those peaks that is lowering the, the RIN value meaning that you have some degradation. So how do you see that here? Well, if, if the RIN values are high, then let's see which ones are those. Those are the, like the red ones where you see that there's, there's almost as much as many reads in the beginning as it is in the end. Whereas when you have a lot of degradation, you pretty much only see the three prime end being sequenced. So do you have any idea why that would be? Sorry? So they are enriched with a poly A, yes. So if you have a poly A tail, um, that type of, of uh, sequencing, you would have that tail at the end here. And if something is uh, degraded in the middle here, you will only see the three prime part because that's what you catch with the poly A tail at the end. So, so then you get this big bias that you almost only get reads that come from the, the very end of, of the sample and that will influence your results as well. So you need, need to keep that in mind. Okay, um, insert size, that's the distance between the two paired end sequences. So the inner distance, how many bases do you have between your two reads? If you do the forward and the reverse sequencing, <clears throat> normally you would have a, a distribution here. In this case, you saw that there, there's uh, two peaks here and that, that could be that there's some, some things going on there that is, I don't know exactly what that would be, but that there are some differences in, 
the size di distribution. So it almost looks like there's two, two groups of, of reads, some that have a, a shorter one and not some that are, have a longer one. Um, you have the saturation curve. It's another measure. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. So once you've done all these quality checks, you've looked at uh, the, the data, you have a good feel for, for how well the alignment worked and the quality, you can move on to do the quantification and get, to actually get the counts. How many times did I capture C reads that, that come from a certain gene or a certain exon? Uh, so the read counts is kind of roughly a measure of the gene expression that you had in your original sample. <clears throat> but you need to keep in mind that this, there's a lot of things that's happened from the time that you extracted the RNA till the time that you sequenced. So it, you need to be aware that there could be some biases there <clears throat> that can influence your result. Um, and you can look at it from a transcript level, a gene level, exon level, depending on your research question. So that's why we sometimes we talk about features when, because it could, it's a, a way of covering all these different aspects. So yeah, as, as it says here, you can work at the gene level, you can work at the transcript level, you can look at alleles. And when you have these, alignments of the reads, <clears throat> you would think, okay, I have an, a read matching. I'll count that as plus one for that gene and it's done, it's easy. But you have all these different cases here that, that can make it a little bit problematic in how do you count these, these alignments and the matches. So if you have a read completely fitting within the gene, that's an easy um, solution. Then you just count that if it's uniquely mapping. Um, if it's overlapping like this, yeah, it's mostly matching, but not 100%. Should you still count it or not? If, if it's covering also some intron sequence, how do you deal with that? <clears throat> Here you have an example of overlapping genes. And if you have, in this case, it's clearly a, a read that comes from the A gene. But if you have some overlap, so it's actually matching both the, the A and B to some extent, then it's of course harder to decide how should I count this? Should I count it as 50% A, 50% B? Should I count it as only one of them? Should I throw that one out because it's ambiguous? Different aligners and quantification systems will use different approaches here when you quantify. Um, and that can influence your results. If you have multi-mapped uh, reads, should you include them or should you not? Should you split that count in between the two? So those are kind of the challenges when you have, for example, gene families that are highly similar in certain regions, you can have multi-mapped reads. If you throw them out, then all of those genes will be more lowly expressed than they they are in reality. But if you count them one, 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 then you can inflate the numbers and you kind of dilute. If, if there's only one of those genes in the, the gene family that's highly expressed, you might just smear out that and put an average number on, on all of those genes. So it's, it's, it's a challenging task for, for the quantification. So that could be good to know. If you're working with something that, that have multi-mapped, have a look at the different methods for quantification and see, does it make a difference if I include this multi-mapped or not? And you already, since you uh, were, were doing so good science and actually checked how much multi-mapping do you have before you continued, you would know how large percentage of it is, am I talking about? Is it a small part? Or is it very common in my samples to have multi-mapped reads? Yes, a question. Sorry? Yes. 
so if you're if you have a lot of multi map, it, it's a tricky um, question what to deal with, how to deal with that. And I think in general, you would have to think about what are you going to do with that downstream. Are you going to just take those counts and you're done? Um, and what are the implications if you leave those multi map out? Are you specifically interested in large gene families or gene duplication events, then maybe you need to put them in, but be aware that there will be some cross matches here when, you, when you're uh, looking at those genes that have a lot of multi-map. And looking at IGV for specific genes of interest could be very helpful. They will be marked so that you can see whether they're uniquely mapping or whether they are multi-mapped. And you can see to what extent do the, um, the other pair out of the two. So when you have this forward reverse, it could be cases where you have one of the reads are multi-map, but the other one is actually uniquely mapping to one. And then you would know where that fragment will go. So it might need some you know, additional uh, work, but keep in mind that it could influence your work, especially if you're working with those um, type of, of uh, genes uh, where you have a lot of similar sequences. I don't know, Roy, do you have any other suggestions for how to deal with multi-mapped? Typically, yeah, you throw them away or? Yeah, so. So yeah, so if you, you if it's a small percentage, I'm just reiterating what you said now. So if it's a small percentage of multi-mapped, then you can test just to ignore them. If it's a larger proportion, then you might not be able to get away with just ignoring those parts or those reads. You should include them, but then be aware of that that could um, cause some some issues in the interpretation. Yes, so it can be important for differential uh, expression analysis. If it's, if it's just a few percent, it's not going to make a huge difference. But it could, it could influence some genes more than others. So when you get those top lists of those super interesting genes, this is fantastic results. I'm really you know, stoked about the results of this particular gene. Then I would go back and check, oh, what's going on? Is it due to its multi-mapping genes that kind of inflates those counts? Or is it something else? Is it, am I really certain that the results I am getting make sense if I actually start scratching the surface a little bit more? So keeping in mind that there are these uncertainties, and then once you have your, your list of, of interesting genes, look at them in IGV. Look at the results of what did I get for those? Are there some weird looking um, biological samples that inflate the total numbers that you know make them different am i really sure that those are fine those samples or is it something that i should look out for and then you can make some educated tests leaving out some samples uh, testing with or without multi-mapping does it make any difference or do i still see what i saw originally then you have more certainty and you, you feel more confident so some so all these um type of bioinformatics analysis are something that you need to do and, and think about the results you're getting and be prepared that you might need to test with some other settings or with some other tools to make sure that what you get is making sense biologically speaking yeah Right, so you have, we talked about PCR duplicates a little bit, but here's a slide on it. Um, PCR is great. We wouldn't be where we are without it, but it also causes uh, some issues. When we are copying these fragments that we have uh, many times, there could be biases. <clears throat> and initially, with the RNA-seq um, world, people were talking about, okay, you, we need to look at those genes or the, those reads that are identical. So start, stop, when you have mapped, are the same. 
then with uh, Picard, uh, what's called mark duplicate, right? Then you can see which ones have exactly the same matching on the genome or whatever your uh, reference is. And then you will just exclude those duplicates. And nowadays that's not really done because it also means that highly expressed genes, you can expect that you would get those results and they could actually be real differences. So you do get the same position sequenced multiple times because we're looking at a small part of the genome usually. And some of those regions are expressed a lot. So we get a lot of sequences there. Then just by chance, we will get the same positions over and over again. Um, so that we will see in the fast QC tests, but we will also see it as possible duplicates <clears throat> or possible BC PCR dupl duplicates, but they can also be real. So typically people are not doing this um, removal of PCR duplicates in RNA-seq samples anymore, but instead we we'll try to solve it by using uh, library prep kits that are PCR free so that they are avoiding the PCR duplication effect by not using PCR as much. Or you can use UMIs. So there's a, <clears throat> there's a random oligo added to each of these fragments. And then you use PCR. And if you amplify, if you have a PCR duplicate, then they would have the same UMI ID. And you know that they originally came from the same fragment and you can kind of collapse that count into one. So then it's both the same sequence and the same UMI. And that is very unlikely that that would happen um, if it wasn't a PCR duplicate. Yeah. So yeah, we talked about multi-mapping quite a bit. So I won't go into that in, in greater detail, but you can either include them, discard them, depending on what you decide to do in your uh, experimental design. And there are different so software for, for that. Count, uh, uh, count methods is the, the most common. It's been around for a long time. You just, <clears throat> um, yeah, you count the abundance of, of the reads basically. Um, when you have multi-mapped, you can then decide whether you should just take uh, assign the read to one of them or assign to both. But then there are these probabilistic assignment um, software that takes into account the uniquely mapping reads and then estimate how you should divide the multi-mapped ones so that you, you don't get this smearing or, and get an average of expression for the multi-mapped parts. So there are different ways of dealing with that in different systems. And you have some, some uh, references here for Arsen, Callisto, Salmon. Um, Callisto and Salmon, as I said, do a different approach. They have, they used, uh, they are fast and they are so-called alignment free. They use uh, small unique tags to try and map. And you can get transcript level counts, uh, estimates and so on. So that is, working surprisingly well. When I heard about it, I said, oh, um, you probably, um, it, it'll be faster, but you might make some mistakes, but it looks like it's actually doing quite well, surprisingly well. And I don't know if you agree, but I think it's, yeah, it, it's really nice. Like, yeah. It has been around for like six, seven years. And yeah. the whole community was very skeptical about it. People still kept doing alignment followed by feature count. Uh, they didn't want to go to this because it was less suspicious. Um, but I think last year it has actually been it is set as the default in the next flow pipeline. Mm. So like it's actually now really established that it's a superior way to uh, get count. Yeah, so it's a really it's good way of doing this. Yeah. It's exactly based on this paper where they actually compared. So it's, it's this one you're talking about, yeah? Yeah, yeah so, so uh, it's, it's a newer way of doing it. And as Roy was saying, it, a lot of people, not only me, were a bit skeptical about it, but it seems to perform actually very, very well. So, so I think it becomes more and more of a standard. 
Um, again, quality control. We need to do quality control at all steps. Think about what we're doing. Does it make sense given what you know about your experiment? And yeah, we talked about multi-QC. It's a good way of getting a way of to compare between many different samples in one plot and also see if there are some samples that do not behave as the others are. And then you can have a closer look at those. Why do they look different? Is it something weird that happened during the RNA extraction, for example? Or is there something else that happened? Yeah. Um, normalization. So what we really want to know, right, is what was the gene expression in that tissue or set of cells that we extracted our RNA from originally. And we don't want to have a, a measure of how much did we sequence one sample versus the other or other technical aspects. Uh, how well did something amplify or how well did the um, pooling of these different libraries work? So since we are dealing with relative numbers, what we typically do is that we use a normalization step. So you have your raw counts where you have the, how many times did I match a certain gene for each of your samples? And then when you have all your samples and all the counts for all the samples, you do a normalization so that you can actually compare between the different samples. Uh, and here are different ways of doing it. And ideally you would like to see that, that they are very similar when you look at it globally, because most of the tools that we're using for differential expression, we assume that the largest proportion of the, the genes will have equal expression in all the tissues, right? So there will be some that will, high, will be highly expressed, others will be lowly expressed, but the difference between the different samples should be the same for the most genes. And then you would have some that are differentially expressed. So that is kind of what the assumption is underlying all the comparisons that we do. And if you don't think that that is true in your sample, then you, you need to think one extra bit before you go and do a look at differential expression. You can sometimes see when you do differential expression that it looks like everything in one sample is upregulated compared to the other. Then you probably have violated that assumption that they are, you know, that most of the genes would be similarly expressed in the different samples. Does that make sense? So we need to normalize because otherwise we're comparing if you sequence twice as much of one sample than the other. If you didn't normalize, it would look like that all the genes were you know, twice as much expressed. But that's just an artificial um, change that we see because of the sequencing effort. So we normalize that away, and then we try to see what is actually happening in, in the biological sample originally. So we try to normalize away the technical differences. <clears throat> then you can explore this and look at it in PCA and other um, ways to investigate, does it make sense? Did I get a good uh, normalization? Does it, do I see grouping? You can look at the heat map um, and see how your different samples are grouping. Like in the PCA, does it make sense? Or is it grouping according to some other parameter for example, the day when the, the sample was extracted. Or um, if, you're, if you're working with, for example, many, many hospitals and they have been, each have been doing their RNA extraction, maybe you see a difference between the different hospitals. Then, and ideally you should be able to see that here and then investigate how, how to deal with that. Yes. Yes, so, so you can normalize uh, sorry, all the samples that you want to look at, for example, differential expression, you should normalize together. 
right? Of that. So the question was whether you can normalize these very different samples. And if you want to compare them, you need to normalize them, but then you should investigate. I think I have something like here, yeah, that you should be aware there could be other reasons why you see differences. And if you have a good study design and you've made a good record of what, which sample was um, extracted, which day, where, by whom, and kind of the possible things that could influence your result. If you have that on record, then you can actually identify it and, and see whether that is confounding your, your results in some ways. Uh, and there are ways of, of uh, identifying these and also uh, software that tries to correct for this. But that is sometimes quite difficult. And ideally, we would like to try and avoid getting those batch effects. But if you have it already, then, I mean, I would suggest come talk to some of us at NBIS and see what we could suggest in your particular case. Is there anything we can do or is it just have to live with those batch effects because it's so confounded with your um, study design so that it's, it's not possible to separate what is the batch effect really related to um, the biological difference that you want to study. Uh, Rin values can have a big batch effect. So if you have that recorded and you should, then that you can also investigate to what exact, to what effect um, Okay, so we can do differential expression. Uh, it's good to remember that we are doing, a, you might say we have so much data, we, we should be able to be pretty clear about what is differentially expressed and not and get really good confidence in, in our statistics. But what we're essentially doing is that we are looking at it from each gene individually. So for only have those three numbers, 12, 8, 13, is it really different from 22, 18, and 25? Right? So you don't have that much power, actually, when you have few replicates. And that's why it's recommended to use many biological replicates, because if you have more in, in each of these, you will have much better statistical power. Um, you often get significantly different expressed genes. That is expected because you're not just testing one gene, whether it's significantly differentially expressed or not, but usually you could have 20,000 genes that you might be testing, or 10,000 or 5,000. So you do 5,000 tests, and then some of them will be significant. So because of that, we, we take into account this multiple testing. So when you get some results, you get the p-value, which may be really low, and then you get the adjusted p-value or a q-value, which is the false discovery rate, and then you calculate so given the amount of testing that we do, is it still significant? And then usually quite a few of, of those that were significant originally are not significant anymore because we're doing so many tests, right? So the way that some of the software have been dealing with this is not to test all the genes. So they use a method saying that, okay, if it's really lowly expressed, uh, for example, then I won't even test for differential expression because that's just gonna be punished in this false discovery rate, this multiple um, testing. So it will only test those that are realistic, that you have enough counts uh, to be able to, to have a chance of finding some differentially expressed genes, and then it will test that and do the false discovery tests on, on that number instead. And that is statistically sound, I've been told. It's not kind of cherry picking or anything, it's, it's fine. Um, 
but just be aware of that we are doing a lot of tests when we're testing all these genes. So, so that could be, I mean, if you're particularly interested in some genes, sometimes you can even go back, do another experiment and say, I'm only going to test these 10 genes. And then, of course, the multiple testing will be a different case. So some have been, but that's not very common, but sometimes you do that. But then, then you should really go down, back and do a new experiment where you have this prediction that these 10 genes are of importance and only test those. Otherwise, it's kind of circular. Yeah? So this is basically showing what the output is. I mentioned some of it. You would have the mean uh, expression. You would have the log twofold change. So if you have two conditions, so how much up or down regulated uh, is that that gene that you're studying here? Um, what else? The p-value I already talked about, and and then the p edge, which is the p adjusted p-value. That this this one is the one that you should be looking at, rather than the p-value itself. You can do a number of different plots to look at what do, what do you see in terms of um, log fold change expression versus counts. <clears throat> the lower number of counts you have, the larger fold difference you need to have to, in order to actually be able to see any significant difference. So the significance, the significant genes are in red, and these gray ones you see here, those are so lowly ex um, expressed and have low fold change, and therefore they are not uh, significantly differentially expressed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So up here, when you see a high uh, mean normalized count, then even a small log fold difference can actually be uh, considered significant. And then you can look at specific genes of interest and just see what's the distribution here between the control in this case and then these type 1, type 2. And you can see that they are more lowly uh, expressed in terms of normalized counts compared to control. So you can actually see how does the variation look like. Because if you only look at the average, there could be some, some of the replicates that really have a very different count, and then that shifts the, the, um, the mean. Here again, log fold change, and then you can see whether there are some differences between up and down regulated genes that you should be uh, aware of or look into. So you can learn something about what these um, expressions are. You Normally, you might expect that you would have the same pattern for the upregulated and downregulated, but of course it depends on what kind of samples, tissues, time points that you are studying. So think back to your experiment and think, does it make sense, the plots that I, I look at, that I see some very highly expressed and, and very significant with big log fold change in the upregulated, but not in the downregulated, for example. Does that make any sense? Then we come finally towards the end here, where we can start looking at the function. If you have annotations, good annotations of, of the genes that you're studying, you can look at are there any enrichment of certain groups of functions. So you would have some genes that have similar functions. They are part of the same pathway, for example, or they have similar uh, biological function. And if they are, many of them are upregulated, you can see that there's an enrichment of these genes compared to what you would expect by random. And then you can come closer to something that is related to the differences that you see between these conditions that you're testing and the actual biological function that these uh, genes uh, that were up or down regulated, what are they doing? And you can learn something more about that. You can look at uh, KEG, 
that's more pathway analysis, uh, primarily uh, enzymatic pathways, but also some other. It's expanded quite a lot in the last years. So all these type of annotations you can then use to see not only getting gene lists and, and looking at each and every gene of these perhaps hundreds of genes that are uh, significantly differentially expressed, but try to see is there some common feature or some common function that, that is um, underlying these patterns of these uh, gene lists. So in summary, um, it's super important, of course, to have the, a good experimental design. Feel free to contact us at NBIS if you have any questions about how to set this up. We have free consultations. We have weekly drop-ins. Please, please use them so that you don't waste all your time and effort and money on something that we cannot really analyze efficiently afterwards. If you haven't done that, I mean, we're still happy to help you with trying to get the most out of your um, data, that data that you have. But I, I really emphasize, try to get uh, a lot of opinions, not only from us, but also from others on how to set up this experimental design in the best possible way. Um, plan carefully about library prep sequencing, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, differential expression, Biological replicates are super important. Don't try to, to uh, avoid doing that or minimize that. I mean, it's a lot of extra work. We realize that, but it really pays off. Um, don't be afraid to discard bad sequences one way or another. Again, your, your time is more valuable than those reads that you're throwing away. Uh, tools, methods that change on a regular basis. You might have been using some here in this course. A few years from now, then there will be some other uh, tools that I'll be using. But the, the way of working and the way of interpreting and thinking about your, your work is still hold. It's still holding. So I think it's, it's still worthwhile, even though tools come and go. Um, yeah, you can try different settings or different pipelines, tools, new things, but of course, don't get stuck in in that uh, loop because you can be testing forever. So try a few things, think hard and long about if it makes sense what you're getting, see if you can control it and test it in some other way so that you know that you might have some pre-knowledge about what you expect to happen and see, do you actually see that? Um, QC, 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 yeah. Look at your results in every step. Before you move on, make sure that you understand and have a good feel for what the data you have is actually looking like and if it really makes sense. And don't be afraid to investigate one extra time or talk to people if they see something that looks odd. Yeah, that's it. Further learning, there's a number of links there you can follow at any time when you feel like it. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And yeah, you've been great asking questions along the way, but if you have some additional ones now, I'll be happy to try and answer them.